Our three ambassadors are, are indeed well known. Uh, Ryan Crocker, to my left here, uh, was ambassador uh, in Afghanistan and more recently than our other two participants, but is well known not just for his service in Afghanistan, but elsewhere. And so uh, we're delighted that he could be with us. Uh, he is uh, a dean of... Uh, Dean at the Texas A&M University presently. And uh, Zal Zalmay Halilzad, to his left, uh, is at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and uh, served as our special envoy to Afghanistan from 2001 to 2003. And of course, Zal was at the United Nations and so many other places. And Ron Newman, uh, well known to us here in Washington for his uh, his presence at uh, many events. Uh, Ron uh, was the ambassador in Afghanistan from 2005 to 2007 and is presently president of the American Academy of Diplomacy. Now, uh, uh, some of you may wonder, Afghanistan, Middle East Institute, I have to remind people that when the Middle East Institute was created in 1946, Afghanistan was included as part of the Middle East. Now, this is foresight, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were already thinking of the greater Middle East. And of course, when Pakistan came into being in 1947, we threw Pakistan in as well. So uh, we're not new to this part of the world, and we're delighted to have uh, you here today and our speakers. And so the format here is going to be that I'm going to pose some questions and uh, have our participants respond to them. We'll leave enough time, certainly uh, at the end of this session, for your questions. So let's get started. <coughs> Uh, gentlemen, uh, this panel is going to be essentially looking forward uh, in um, the role of the United States in Afghanistan and in the, the country's future. But before we do that, can I ask you, if looking back, what gave you during your time in Afghanistan, what gave you the greatest satisfaction and what was your greatest disappointment during that period that you were serving uh, this country in Afghanistan? Whoever likes to start, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no order of things here. Okay, Zal. So. <laughs> uh, well, for me, uh, first of all, I want to thank Lou for his uh, leadership on this and thank him for his service at, uh, in Afghanistan during the period that I was there. And I'm delighted to be here with my two very distinguished colleagues, uh, especially uh, Ryan and I. I've done quite a few things together, so and uh, some of which we won't tell you. About. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, but for me, of course, uh, I uh, was in Afghanistan. Uh, besides having been born there and spent a lot of my early life in Afghanistan, uh, twice in an official capacity. Once, as was said, as the president's envoy right after uh, the Bonn Agreement, uh, and sec for the last until 2003, and then I went as ambassador from 2003 to 2005. So if I have to think about the, the kind of the emotional sense that I had with returning after 30 plus years uh, uh, and seeing Kabul uh, devastated, uh, a dead city essentially when I arrived there in January 2002, was my first uh, 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 kind of trip after 9-11. Uh, flying from Tashkent in a small plane. I think uh, uh, when I landed at the Kabul airport, the international airport that now is seems very busy and the Japanese have built a terminal that has been opened and there is a new VIP uh, lounge that's quite impressive. Uh, but then I remember uh, a very elderly man uh, who has since passed away uh, 
pushing a ladder uh, to, to the plane so I could get off and we had a little bit of the hard time uh, uh, kind of synchronizing the ladder and this little plane that the government had provided for me to take me uh, to, to Kabul. But my, my, if I had to reflect uh, on the positive, uh, great positive experience uh, uh, was uh, that Afghanistan was very divided as uh, we know politically. Uh, they had been left uh, the pro-Soviet takeover 78 and then even the left fighting each other the Parcham and Khaled, there are a lot of Afghans in the audience, uh, or Afghan Americans and others who are experts. And then uh, the Soviets coming in, the Mujahideen fighting the Soviets, and then the Mujahideen fighting each other, and then the uh, uh, Taliban emerging, and then the Northern Alliance fighting the Taliban, and uh, so there's been a history of, of, of uh, uh, not uh, uh, coming to agreement on key issues. And the, uh, uh, the politics uh, 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 of uh, helping uh, as the United States in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, did play a critical role with the help of the United Nations, Lakhtar Brahimi and uh, John Orno, I want to mention both of them who played an important role to get a, an agreement on the Constitution and participating in the Constitution of Loy Jerga and, uh, and getting the various groups. Uh, I, I know that some might ask about the Taliban not being part of that process at that time and would be happy to engage on that as to what exactly happened or did not happen with regard to the Taliban participation in the early period in the political process. But it was a high uh, uh, point, uh, as I have felt myself. I mean, there were so many of them because, you know, the, uh, they op the, the school open was a, a very emotional day. I will never forget until I die that, that, that all adults who were in the audience, including a couple of foreigners uh, like Lachter and, and I represented the U.S. at that time, was in tears the day that schools were reopened. And, at, at, and both my colleagues remember in March the, the there is the uh, opening of the school year when uh, uh, after so many years, uh, President Karzai, then he may have been, when, when the first time when it happened, he was chairman. Uh, 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 that was uh, a high point. But I think the constitutional agreement, uh, the compromises that were made, that they seized the moment and did agree uh, was uh, was uh, was, uh, uh, was a, po a very positive for me. On the negative, and I wanna, wanna hear my colleagues, on the negative, I would say that uh, my phone frustration, and, and I would uh, obviously value Ryan's uh, comments too, because he served on both sides of the border uh, with distinction. And I would say that our frustration, my own frustration, able, inability to get a, an agreement between Afghanistan and Pakistan on uh, uh, the kind of cooperating against extremism and terror and facilitating uh, a settlement that would have brought the Taliban into the political process was my greatest frustration because uh, I could see uh, and, and I sometime out of frustration I would speak even publicly that the sanctuary was in the process of being developed that was going to make the, the, the task much harder, would take a lot more time and would be far more expensive uh, than what we initially were willing to invest in Afghanistan. That changed over time, but our initial strategy was to be of a minimal footprint, uh, uh, some effort, not a lot. Uh, 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 we didn't want to own the problem. Uh, we wanted the Afghans to, to take care of it. So that, I think, uh, uh, I would say in terms of a uh, big issue was my, my biggest frustration. Ron? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a, they're hard questions to answer, actually, to try to tease out one or two things from massive impressions. In the, uh, on, on the side of satisfaction, uh, partly just reconnecting to Afghanistan, I, I didn't grow up there as, as Al did, but I did first visit in 1967 and was all over the country, all the way through the center and up into the Wakhan, Badakhshan. Just reconnecting with the country and the society and the people was enormously satisfying. Um, 
one of the things that continues to give me enormous satisfaction that I began to see there was the younger generation of Afghans, the 20-somethings, 30-somethings, who are really a, a different group and who really hold out the promise of a very different, better future for their country if we can get through the short term and some of the old leadership, I have great faith that we can that it can go a long way in the longer run and with the younger leadership. And I remember going to the what's now the American University of Afghanistan, which Zal gave a great deal of help to get started. Uh, and, and it's all of us have worked on that project, but it was it was very emotional for me because it was on the grounds of what was the American International School in Kabul, where my brother graduated from high school. And so to go back and in the very early days and to find the students as inspiring as they were, I suppose professionally, perhaps most satisfying was the recognition that we were working on the energy side in too many stovepipes, and that we were working working too much not wrongly, but that our focus had become so internal that a lot, some of what we were doing was sort of like building a extension cord without making sure we had a socket to put it into and starting the discussions, we're getting the Afghan government to start the discussions with Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan that, that led to the energy agreements that were essential to put power down through the lines. And like everything else one does, getting those things done was a great deal more than effort than conceptualizing what needed to be done. But it reminds me, talking about this, something my father told me years ago, which is that as an ambassador, you neither finish what you start nor start what you finish. That you come and you pick up what your predecessor has done and you build on it and you start things which you don't necessarily finish. Uh, it's not a one-year efficiency report cycle. I would say my greatest disappointment was the absolute inability to convince Washington that 2006 was going to be a bloody bad year of the insurgency getting much worse. And we reported this, we predicted it, then General Eikenberry agreed. Uh, we Iraq was just sucking up the energy and but not wrongly because Iraq had its share of problems, <laughs> but, uh, but we got no traction. And, and the most visible example of this was that we had recommended $600 million, which seemed like a very big number then. Now it seems kind of small, but it seemed like a big number for additional economic assistance to use in a variety of ways, including some in the north that needed stabilization, but it wasn't a combat area. And uh, out of that request, uh, 600 million months of bureaucratic wrangling, at the end of the day, we got 43. Oh. Mm. Uh, we got less than a nickel on the dollar. Uh, actually, much less because 11, so almost, uh, almost a quarter of that was actually not aid for Afghanistan, but a paper transfer to, to make up for the cost of debt rescheduling. So actually, for money on the ground, we got 32 out of the 600 million we asked for. And it, the troop issues were the same. It was a manifestation of the fact that we just, we lost a lot of valuable time, even when it was possible to see that we were really going to need it. And anyway, it's a different comparison now. In, in Zal's first tour, this was a period where all of everybody thought the Taliban was really defeated. There was no neon sign, remember, flashing on the hill that says, by the way, you got to be done by 2006. The war's going to start. Um, you know, but by 2005, we were able to analyze what was happening and NATO's going into the South and to know that, I mean, no, we were able to predict with a great measure of assurance uh, that the insurgency was going to get very, very bad and very bloody in the next year. And we got absolutely no help to do anything about it. And that certainly is one of my greatest disappointments. Somebody asked me at a much later period after big budgets came in, you know, how does it feel you know, to essentially have been right? And I said, well, bittersweet because, you know, it's nice, but that doesn't help. Thank you. Uh, you might have uh, gathered from Ron's remarks that uh, his father was the ambassador to Afghanistan from 1967 to 1973. Ryan? Uh, 
as, as Al noted, uh, we were both engaged in Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. Uh, I reopened our embassy there in the beginning of January 2002. And I couldn't even land in Kabul. Uh, the, the runways were completely inoperative, uh, so we had to come in at Bagram, uh, ford a river, uh, go through miles of devastation to get to what was left of the capital. Uh, that perspective um, uh, left me with a, a sense that the glass was really at least half full uh, when I returned subsequently and then as ambassador in, in 2011. Uh, given the absolute nothing uh, with which the country started, the achievements uh, always seemed to me uh, even greater than the obstacles. It also left me with a, a deep um, uh, sympathy and affinity to the Afghan people generally and to uh, President Karzai in particular. Uh, we certainly had our uh, rough innings with him, but, but given what he went through, uh, the absolute nothing with which he started uh, and what he was able to, uh, to oversee, I think uh, history and I hope um, this country is going to uh, look at him in a more kindly light than maybe the case now. Um, so we fast forward to my time there. Uh, the achievements that occurred on my watch, for which I really can't claim credit, but I will, because in the course of my career, I was blamed for a lot of things I, I really don't think were my fault. Uh, uh, the achievements were to put in place a bilateral and international architecture uh, for the long-term security and stability of Afghanistan. Uh, and these things came together uh, fairly quickly in the spring and summer of um, uh, 2012. The uh, strategic partnership agreement between Afghanistan and the United States uh, that I led the negotiations for uh, I, I saw as really an historic moment. Uh, we had never had that kind of written alliance, if you will, uh, between the United States and Afghanistan. President Obama flew out to, uh, uh, to Afghanistan to sign it with uh, President Karzai at the uh, beginning of May. Uh, and it seemed to me that uh, we had the, the bilateral block in place. We then uh, went to, all of us went to Chicago uh, later in May for the, the NATO summit. And what that summit did uh, was solidify international commitments to the long-term out-year international support for Afghan security forces. Uh, there we were much motivated by what had happened in Afghanistan uh, after the Soviet defeat. The Afghan forces literally soldiered on uh, with the Soviets gone. Uh, and they kept on fighting uh, until the money ran out. Uh, that's when the state effectively collapsed and the civil war was on. So, so getting that, that second block in place was very, very important. And then the third uh, came in uh, July of 2012, uh, the Tokyo Economic Ministerial, in which the international community then stepped up to the, uh, the economic side of the challenge with uh, some $16 billion uh, pledged in economic support against Afghan undertakings that they developed themselves uh, for steps they would take to ensure that these funds were indeed a good investment. My greatest disappointment was the flip side of this, uh, uh, in which the United States seemed to lose interest in Afghanistan. Um, and a fundamental truth here, whether it's in Iraq or in Afghanistan, you don't end a war by withdrawing your forces. You simply leave the battlefield to your adversaries. Uh, and it's not just 
I think, a, a failure to fulfill the, the promise of the strategic partnership. But we're America. Uh, where America leads, others will follow. That's what we demonstrated in Chicago and in Tokyo. If America doesn't lead, everybody else finds something else to do, uh, particularly if it involves money. Uh, so, we, we are gathered here today uh, at what I hope and would like to believe is uh, the beginning of a new dawn um, for Afghanistan, the United States, and the international community in the wake of um, uh, President Ashraf Ghani and um, CEO Abdullah Abdullah's uh, very, very positive visit here um, uh, uh, just a bit ago. So. From hope to depression to hey, hope hey, again. Hey. Some of us never learn. We keep on hope. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, you've just mentioned the visit of uh, Ashraf Ghani, President Ashraf Ghani, and CEO Dr. Abdullah here last week, and uh, and there was uh, much talk in town on what the contrast was here between that visit and our our relationship with Hamid Karzai before. Uh, <clears throat> And in fact, uh, also uh, continued uh, remarks about how fortunate the United States is to have these two men. Yes, two men, because in many ways they seem to complement one another, uh, if given the opportunity. Uh, let me ask in, in this light, uh, how at this point in time can we best assure that these men are going to succeed? Anyone? I'll make one comment, but my colleagues know this just this subject as well or better than I do. Um, first of all, they have to succeed if Afghanistan is to have a future. Together, they have a mandate. Seventy percent of Afghans who voted voted for one of the two of them. We're not quite sure which one, but they but we know that they all voted for one of the two of them. So they have a heck of a mandate together. They have neither one despite what each believes, has a mandate if they separate. There are a lot of, I believe their good, personal relations are good. I believe they want to make this work. My colleagues can speak to this as well. There are a lot of tensions in this relationship. And that's inevitable. And there are a lot of tensions that are not in the personal relationship, but in the fact that each um, rides heard on a disparate group of supporters that are not necessarily loyal lieutenants, but groups hungry for their own share of power. That's a very, very tough act to follow, and it's a to, to manage. And we should remember this is still a a weak central government. And for those of you who have some historical background, in many ways you could compare what you have in Afghanistan to the Middle Ages, the period of state consolidation. It's not about decentralization. First of all, it's about having enough authority to control. So in this very difficult situation, the United States has to play a very careful role. One thing it has to do is maintain its support, military and financial. Without that, everything falls apart. The second thing it has to do is to be willing to help moderate and arbitrate in some very difficult cases some of the frictions but not to be in it all the time not to be responsible for governing Afghanistan uh, Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Ghani have to have that responsibility not to be jumping in taking responsibility and not to be telling other people how to run things but at the same time there will be issues where the the face and the prestige and other things make it almost essential to have a third party involved. They could, I do not believe they could have reached the political settlement they had without our intervention. That kind of work is what we need diplomats for. It's not the kind of work you can do with a committee in Washington. Uh, it's an art form, it's not a science, but it's going to, and it's not going to, if it's done well, it's not going to show very much. But it is, a, I think, going to be an essential piece of helping them get to success. I'd like to add uh, to what Ron said, uh, one that uh, generally when we look around the world, uh, uh, 
the history of unity governments are, uh, is not a successful one. Uh, they generally do not work. Uh, um, on the other hand, I know both of these gentlemen uh, quite well. Uh, Ashraf Ghani, uh, we were uh, together, in, uh, we came to America together since high school, in other words. Uh, so, and Dr. Abdallah, at least for uh, since the Soviet uh, war, which is uh, 30 years plus. And I think they've been witnesses uh, to uh, the tragedy of um, uh, recent Afghanistan, uh, 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 where this uh, not accepting each other and uh, wanting all for oneself and nothing for the other side uh, has uh, produced great tragedies uh, for Afghanistan since they have been witnesses uh, to, to the uh, recent uh, history. I think uh, uh, the agreement between them was not uh, easy, but uh, I know that in the discussions prior to the election, both had uh, talked about this concept of ijma, uh, 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 a consensus, uh, and the need for consensus on some key issues. Uh, and uh, that's part of the platform of uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, but also even Dr. Abdullah and his group talked about this. Um, uh, th that they needed to accept each other and to uh, the winner take all uh, approach would be disastrous uh, uh, for Afghanistan given the complexities uh, of, of, of the place. I agree with Ron that our role was, uh, was indispensable uh, in helping uh, bring them to, into the uh, to agreement in detail, um, but I think that the principle of wanting to work together uh, was uh, was uh, was uh, was there. That makes me in that uh, recognition makes me hopeful. Uh, but it wouldn't be easy. Uh, if, uh, it will require constant work um, on the part of the two leaders because they are very committed to it. In my judgment, although uh, necessarily in the teams there would be you know. There, positions of uh, power. There are so many slots that you can, uh, you have, uh, and uh, there are natural rivalries for those slots from the two teams. Um, but I think uh, it would require uh, 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 work on the part of the two leaders, but also I agree with Ron's point that it would require uh, that uh, we continue to be attentive and helpful. Uh, and I think there has been a qualitative improvement in our relationship uh, with uh, with Afghanistan and with the team. And there was a period, however, uh, lest we forget uh, that uh, we had a tremendously uh, positive relation with President Karzai before it, it, became, it went sour. So. Uh, and we uh, uh, have to take part of the blame for what happened, and uh, of course, <laughs> he, uh, and, uh, and and he too. But uh, but uh, uh, we cannot take it for granted. Uh, um, during uh, the, my period, at least, uh, I, I had hardly any uh, problem that we couldn't work out with President Karzai at that time, uh, and. Uh, in, and he was much praised in this town. Uh, his skills was compared to President Clinton at one point when he came for a visit when he addressed Congress. And for him to be the successor to Mullah Omar obviously was a huge. Uh, uh, he was lucky in, the, in, the, in his predecessor so in that regard. But uh, but he, 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 uh, so uh, we can't take that the honeymoon that we're in with the current team automatically continues, it will require work, it require, we learn lessons of, from uh, our experience with President Kaiser, especially why it turned sour. We need to be very attentive uh, to not to repeat some of the, uh, the, 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 the mistakes that caused that souring to occur on our part. But uh, similarly, I think they, for the Afghans, they, they had uh, this, uh, one of the things that I learned, and I'll end with that, is that uh, when I went back to Afghanistan uh, after 30 plus years, I thought the Afghans were kind of uh, rather anti-foreign and maybe kind of uh, would not want too much America. Uh, 
and 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 what I discovered uh, uh, in the course of the first month of my envoy ship and uh, Ryan may have had the same experience because we were there at the same time uh, that period was the, f the greatest fear was fear of abandonment uh, rather than uh, on balance of sort of at this at that point in any case of being uh, being uh, kind of uh, run by or dominated by by America. <laughs> You know, simply put, Marvin, it is to be the long-term strategic partner to Afghanistan, uh, about which we have an agreement signed by two presidents saying we will. Um, uh, Zal is exactly right in talking about a fear of abandonment, and uh, in the, the run-up to uh, the visit, we heard that, all of us, um, over and over and over again. Uh, the, the, the fear that we were going to leave Afghanistan alone uh, with the prospect that um, it would not fare much better without us than it did without us um, in the 19, first half of the 1990s. Uh, so that is fundamental. Um, uh, we do need to learn how to manage that relationship, particularly with the two principal leaders. Uh, uh, they rely greatly on the U.S., both uh, bilaterally and as a leader of the international community, but they're also profoundly uh, Afghan nationalists, as is President Karzai. And, and we do have to respect that. Uh, uh, that is not an impossible challenge for diplomacy, um, although sometimes we fail it. Uh, so it's, it's knowing when we need to be engaged and how to be engaged. And again, we've got both good examples and bad examples uh, uh, since 2001, what to do and, and what not to do. And I would agree with my, uh, uh, my friends that uh, uh, it's rather unlikely Afghanistan would be where it is today without our intervention uh, uh, post-election to uh, help broker an agreement that each side could live with. Uh, and we will have to be attentive to the tensions uh, inherent in that relationship and other tensions uh, and contradictions uh, throughout Afghan society. Uh, in particular, that while um, uh, President Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, uh, we all saw it here in Washington, um, it, it clearly can work together and engage together. It's probably less true as you go down the line in their respective camps. Um, so we are going to have to be alert to that. But most fundamentally, we have to be clear, we are in this relationship for the long run. Uh, uh, without it, uh, the uh, cent centrifugal forces are, are gonna take over. Uh, it's also extremely important vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. You know, I, again, have served on both sides of the Durand line. Uh, uh, speaking of the Duran line, I've found in my um, many years in the Middle East, the greater Middle East, uh, I had to account for my presence in Afghanistan and Pakistan somehow, so I just folded them in, uh, uh, that when things are going badly and fingers are pointing at us, blame the British. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, you know, for the, the Pakistanis to understand, well, this isn't going to be um, 1990 all over again, where they go from being the most allied of allies to the most sanctioned of adversaries literally overnight. Uh, the, the Pakistanis need to have the confidence that uh, we are a long-term strategic factor uh, uh, on their border, and indeed in their country, uh, if we want them to quit hedging their bets. I take it from the remarks here that all three of you agree that uh, neither we nor the Afghans have a plan B. That this is, this is, uh, this is, we have this one, perhaps this one opportunity. 
uh, I think that I also detect here, uh, especially from things you've said before, that uh, the three of you question the plan here to have uh, an exit of all American military forces by the end of 2016. Uh, the president at the moment has been flexible with respect to the uh, troop withdrawal for 2015, uh, but he has uh, stood quite firmly on the, on the exit in 2016. What is it going to take? for him to to change his mind as you see it. Uh, how likely do you think that is and uh, 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 with what consequences? So? Well, I think Afghanistan has been lucky uh, to a degree because of the experience in Iraq and also uh, the rise of ICE, uh, ISIS, ISIL. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we have had an experiment almost uh, uh, that uh, in the case of Iraq uh, that uh, both Ryan and I have uh, served in uh, that uh, and you did too, right? Yeah. Yes, of course. I, I forgot you came that. from uh, yeah, Iraq to Afghanistan. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Uh, so uh, that uh, our uh, total departure uh, of forces and having just the Office of Security Cooperation and the embassy uh, uh, who, uh, uh, followed by uh, a series of developments that uh, uh, you know, was not good for Iraq, not good for us, not good for the region. Uh, and it, it was a polarizing effect inside Iraq by regional arrivals trying to fill in the vacuum uh, created by our departure. Uh, and add to that the, uh, the Syrian uh, unraveling of Syria. Um, uh, and uh, now we have uh, had to go back uh, um, to get involved in, uh, in, in the fight against ICE and, uh, and, and to send some free people uh, back in. Uh, uh, I believe that Afghanistan uh, with the, uh, the investment that we have made in the building of the security forces and with the commitment that has been made to the uh, based as uh, Ryan mentioned the Chicago uh, to the Afghan security forces uh, and with some uh, uh, presence that's a success in my view because if you can go from 120,000 in the case of Afghanistan Iraq of course there was a period we had a lot more to a force of uh, you know five ten thousand uh, and uh, 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 work with the uh, environment and with the Afghans so that can they truly can 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 uh, manage their security problem. That is a uh, that that is a model of success in, in my view. Sure, we would have liked this to uh, be done in five years or in ten. But I could tell you stories that in, in part because of we started slow on building the security forces initially. We didn't, uh, we wanted only the forces the Afghan could, could afford. And that the Afghans, uh, given what Ryan described, what I experienced, what Afghanistan was like, they could hardly afford anything. I remember being admonished repeatedly during that period to get your hands off the bike uh, uh, and let the Afghans. Uh, deal with these issues and I would say well please show me the bike uh, I'd be happy to to get my hand off of this thing if I could find it uh, uh, because they, there was hardly anything uh, uh, there at that time so if we wanted them to have the force they could afford that would have been hardly anything besides there is enormous uncertainty uh, in the environment on terrorism uh, on what would, uh, would happen and the Afghans would like us to maintain uh, force and it's not very uh, popular in that region to have uh, uh, forces there so we have Afghanistan related interests we have terrorism related interests we have other broader regional interests that I think justifies uh, maintaining a residual force beyond 2016 now as to whether the president uh, uh, will change his mind uh, on this issue. I think that there is indication that uh, he's willing to have a conversation about it, and I think a conversation was had during this visit. 
uh, I think he has political imperatives for not appearing uh, 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 that he's easily changed his mind and maybe he's also thinking to keep this at this point maybe to get some things from the Afghans that they can and they will deliver on their part uh, on the unity front on some of the reforms that they have been committed uh, uh, um, but I believe that uh, that uh, uh, well I can't predict uh, uh, I, I think the geopolitical requirements uh, future stability of Afghanistan our national interests in my judgment require if needed, uh, to maintain a, a residual force, and the case of Iraq uh, uh, demonstrates uh, that, that necessity, in my judgment. Right. I, I, anybody who is looking for controversy among us is <laughs> clearly not finding it. Uh, I would agree completely with my, my colleagues. Um, Iraq is instructive in a, a pretty dramatic and sad way of what happens um, when you say you're ending a war, but all you're doing again is ceding the battlefield. Um, uh, and our disengagement, as I indicated earlier, from Afghanistan and indeed from Pakistan uh, after the Soviet defeat is instructive. Um, uh, we can look at Iraq uh, for a parallel, but we find the example right there in Afghanistan uh, decades earlier. Uh, uh, and as, as Zal and Ron have said, this is our vital national interest. Uh, but there's something else, too, in the argument, I think, from moving from a calendar-based timetable to a conditions-based timetable, where I've long argued we needed to have been in, in Iraq and certainly need to be in Afghanistan. This is the intersection of American interests and American values. And we, uh, I think, are unique among major states in uh, uh, as a nation founded uh, on values, of interweaving them with our policies. Uh, it, is, it is very, very difficult at times, as we all know. Uh, and we're seeing some of that, uh, of course, today around the world. But Iran cited uh, the newest, greatest generation in Afghanistan, the um, Afghans who have come of age post-Taliban and uh, exemplified by the graduates of the American University of Afghanistan. They are like no other generation Afghanistan has ever produced. Uh, open to the world, uh, uh, plugged in, wired up. Uh, they, they think in terms dramatically different uh, from, from their parents. And they are the long-term guarantee for security and stability in Afghanistan, but um, they've got to have the chance to solidify their presence and their influence. Women in Afghanistan, uh, and it, sometimes it seems to me we're trying to have it both ways. We, we, we urged women to step forward. Um, we supported them as they did so, uh, and now, or at least up until uh, President Ghani's visit, uh, it was as though we were saying to them, goodbye and good luck. Well, the luck would not be very good uh, if we were to decide, we're done here, we're gonna draw down to nothing, and whatever happens, happens, not our problem. Well, in addition to the security ramifications uh, that um, uh, we've all addressed, uh, there are fundamental issues about who we are as a nation and as a people. Um, are we going to let the young people that we encouraged, the girls and women of Afghanistan that we've encouraged, just take it in the neck, quite literally, um, by, by pulling out prematurely and letting things unfold as they may? Uh, we saw the horrific episode with the um, uh, uh, recently, uh, it isn't just the Taliban. Uh, there are some pretty dark forces that still permeate Afghan society. They're moving in the right direction, but they're going to need us uh, for some time to come to ensure that they don't backslide or come apart in a way that threatens both our security uh, and calls into question 
what values we really hold as Americans. We'll be judged by this. Okay. And two points, but I, I to you totally agree with my colleagues, therefore I won't say any of the same things, or I'll try not to. Um, and I think Ryan's point about the moral implications are, is really important. President Obama in the last six months has made a number of incremental decisions that I would call positive and correct in terms of slightly extending the timeline for forces and allowing air support for Afghans uh, in extremis. Uh, then again, extending, not enlarging, but extending the time for a deployment. I, so those are all, in my judgment, very correct decisions. The way we are making them, however, robs them of much of their psychological value. Ryan and, and Zal, have, we've all made the point about the need for America to remain a long-term partner. And a piece of that is, a big piece of that is the Afghan and regional belief belief that that is so. The incremental way in which we are approaching policy continually undercuts the belief that we are really there for the long term. And one of the things I worry about is that we will, from month to month and year to year, continue our support from Afghanistan, but we will do it in such an incremental and haphazard fashion that we will never get the political value of those decisions with either the Afghan people or the insurgents. Uh, so there, it is both the nature of the decisions, but the way in which they are made that's important. And I totally subscribe to the notion that we do not have the ability to end this war. We have never been about ending it. We have only been about pulling our own forces out and leaving a nasty, bloody war to somebody else. And I wish we would be honest about it. The other thing I think we need to think about in this regard is what is it we are planning to do about NATO? NATO has does not have have a time limit per se, but it cannot stay without us and it will not and cannot make any decisions without our decisions being made first. Now this ought to be a no-brainer because even if we're in the combat role, we've said we will still leave military in Afghanistan in a training mission even if they're under the embassy. Well, if we're going to be training, we ought to want help. We want to want other people helping us train. NATO is the logical vehicle. We know there's going to be an assistance requirement for Afghanistan. If we're going to be doing assistance, we ought to want help in that. If other countries have their troops involved, they will be more inclined to make assistance commitments. So we ought to be focusing very hard on extending to some degree the NATO mandate beyond 2016, however we constitute our part of it, so that we don't just fall off the edge of a cliff. And NATO is not a, you know, this is 26 nations and steering a super tanker is easy compared to getting turns and, you know, you just don't get quick adjustments with 26 nations. So that while we are busy contemplating our own future month by month, we really need to stake out a NATO policy. Thank you. We want to leave time for questions from the audience here, but let me pose one last question from the panel here. Uh, for the panel, uh, how do you view the prospects for a agreement with the Taliban? Uh, what priority should the United States give to uh, this strategy of, of finding terms on which we can uh, uh, hope that the Afghan government and the Taliban can agree on. Uh, and uh, if in the course of your remarks you could indicate the, where you think Pakistan figures in this, uh, please do. Ron, you want to I'm going to try to keep this really short because I know my colleagues are going to have something to say. Um, I agree that a political solution is highly desirable. I think we should stop saying there is no possibility of a military solution you can lose. Um, so, I think it is very important for Americans to understand that a political solution comes, or a negotiation that leads to a solution comes when everybody more or less decides they can't win. It does not come by running around with your tongue hanging out chasing a political solution which suggests desperation. 
we have almost nothing with which to negotiate anymore, except we could betray the Afghan government and leave them on their own. So negotiations are not our real business. They are the business of the Afghan government. We should support them, but we should not try to be in front of them. Secondly, the biggest support we can give to negotiations is the belief that we will continue our support so that the Afghan government and military will not lose. They don't have to be able to win. They have to be able not to lose, and everybody has to believe that. Um, let me, I'm just going to stop there. I believe in this. I think it's a very long-term solution. I think when you look at all other conflicts ended by negotiation, you have to look at a very, very long-term proposition in which you should expect that fighting will get worse after you begin negotiations as people seek to uh, improve their position on the battlefield. So that supporting negotiations means supporting a long-term help to Afghanistan financially and militarily accepting that they're in the lead and accepting that negotiations will have to pass through, if you get there at all, will have to pass through a period of intensified combat. Uh, well, uh, we tend to, uh, in uh, recent time, I mentioned before with regard to unity government record not being uh, good globally, uh, we tend to uh, start wars the recent, in recent time with uh, great fanfare and commitment and enthusiasm, and we don't tend to end them well, um, uh, in, at least in recent times. Uh, and uh, on this specific issue of uh, uh, reconciliation or agreement, um, I know that the uh, new government in Afghanistan is, is, is trying very hard and has made a number of adjustments uh, unilaterally uh, to encourage uh, uh, reconciliation or, or a, a peace process, uh, an agreement. Uh, they have uh, intensified engagement with Pakistan, uh, recognizing that Pakistan plays a vital role in and facilitating and helping or hindering uh, uh, such a such a uh, project, uh, they have uh, um, moved against elements that are hostile to Pakistan, uh, uh, so that there will be no reason for Pakistan not to help. Uh, uh, they have uh, sent some. Uh, cadets to be trained in Pakistan, which is not very popular in Afghanistan given the history of the relationship, and nevertheless this government has taken that step. They have uh, 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 frozen the acceptance of some military assistance from India to say, uh, let's take another look at this, let's wait. Uh, it has intensified relations with China in part because of wanting to uh, impact Pakistan, recognizing that uh, Chinese-Pakistani relations are very important for Pakistan. And uh, having China more involved in Afghanistan is also seen by the leadership as indicating to Pakistan that, the, you know, that their fear of India uh, uh, being uh, so involved uh, is balanced now by wanting their friend Chinese involved also. And uh, Saudi Arabia is another country that there has been an intensification of relations with in part because of, uh, of uh, uh, the impact that that could have or they would like it to have on reconciliation and relations with Pakistan. Now, on the negative side of the ledger, uh, in my judgment, one is this uncertainty about the long-term U.S. Uh, commitment to uh, Afghanistan. Uh, already the dramatic reductions in the force uh, presence, uh, I think 
probably uh, as, uh, leads uh, some in the Taliban leadership, uh, the military wing, at least to say, let's test the forces uh, now that they are largely on their own, uh, with, uh, although there is the U.S. help. <laughs> and if there is a belief that uh, beyond 2016 there will be none, uh, uh, that may uh, uh, encourage them to wait and see what the uh, balance of forces or power would be after this coming fighting season and then maybe you know, post until even after 2016. So uh, uh, that's one uh, 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 issue and I believe the government recognizes uh, that they need to prepare uh, and push for both uh, engagement relatively quickly and I think there is some disappointment that uh, the meetings that they expected to see happen with uh, representatives or the leadership of the Taliban have not yet occurred. They thought with all the measures and steps that they've taken perhaps a meeting would have happened by now. Uh, uh, um, but at the same time that they need to prepare both for an intent intensified fight for the coming season and also push uh, simultaneously uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, reconciliation with all the elements that, that I described. Uh, 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 my own judgment is in the near term uh, prospects are, are, are not uh, very promising because of this uncertainty with regard to the US uh, longer term and the desire to test the forces without as much help internationally uh, as, uh, as possible. Uh, there may be opportunities for the government with elements because the Taliban and the opposition is quite fragmented and diverse. Uh, uh, perhaps more opportunities in the near term in that domain than a, a comprehensive uh, settlement uh, that uh, even if a meeting occurs, I think that it's going to be a pro very protracted process. There may be a period of both fighting and, and perhaps meeting, even if a, if a meeting does occur. I think everything worth saying on this subject has been said by my colleagues, but that won't stop me from saying it again. Um, uh, uh, two critical elements uh, were noted. Um, as, as, as Ron said, um, this ultimately has got to be an Afghan matter. Uh, 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 a peaceful future in Afghanistan is not going to be negotiated by the United States. It has to be done by Afghans. Um, and then as, as Zal said, we have got to persuade both allies and adversaries as well as those on the fence uh, that we are in this for the long run. Uh, we have many great qualities as Americans, uh, but we have a few shortcomings, and one of those is a lack of what I call strategic patience. Uh, uh, you know, we're good at going in with uh, drums and bugles uh, when the campaign starts, and when it gets hard, costly, and blood and treasure, um, and it's taken way too long, uh, meaning it's not over a week from Friday, um, uh, we start finding other things we want to do. Now, what has happened in the greater Middle East over years of this, this is something our allies fear in us and our adversaries count on. So our greatest contribution to negotiations is not really being part of it. Uh, it is demonstrating to friend and foe alike uh, that this time we're in it for the long run. Because that is the only way the uh, calculus in Pakistan and among the Taliban, I think, is going to change in a way that would make um, a negotiation um, first possible and ultimately successful. There is something I think we can do if and when uh, serious talks are held, and that is to be sure the Afghan government understands the importance of involving women in the negotiating process. Um, I, I talked about this before. Uh, uh, you know, what happens to women in Afghanistan in the long run is very much a concern of ours. Uh, and this is not measured in employment opportunities, it can be measured in lives. Uh, and if 
we want to facilitate and foster a, a solid negotiation and ultimately the prospect of a solid agreement, uh, the other half of the Afghan population has got to be an integral and key part of this process. At this point, we're going to entertain your questions. I ask you to stand as you offer your question and uh, identify yourself. Please keep it short. Uh, and if you wish to direct it to a particular panelist, uh, do so. So let's write right down front here. I wait. Please wait for the mic. Yes. I'm uh, Eleanor Bakrak. I served uh, with USAID in both Afghanistan and Iraq from uh, 2008 to 2010. Um, I was uh, appalled <laughs> from the start when I heard we were planning to go to war in Iraq. I thought it would be a disaster, um, and I was particularly concerned about uh, what happened pretty inevitably, which is that we pulled back a lot from uh, uh, what we were doing in Afghanistan. It became sort of second place, and I've often, I'd be interested in your views as to whether uh, I suppose it's, uh, I don't know how productive it is, but whether this really uh, did set things back in Afghanistan, whether things might have worked out better had we not uh, distracted ourselves. Gentlemen? I, uh, I will speak first uh, because I know the least about it. Uh, um, um, you know, the United States was and is capable of doing more than one thing at a time. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Iraq uh, soaked up a great deal of resources, but I, I would suggest, from my perspective, this goes back to something Zal said. Uh, what what really affected our engagement in Afghanistan was the initial position that this was going to be an economy of force mission, and we were very slow to come off of that. Uh, Iraq may have been a contributing factor, but I think it was that initial mindset uh, that we were going to keep our investment and exposure in Afghanistan to a minimum. Uh, I will always remember uh, in those early days in 2002, we had a, having taken a shot at the British, I will now give them a pat on the back, we had an enormously capable ISAF commander, a British Major General named John McCall. Uh, and he and I kind of looking ahead to some of the challenges of the extension of government authority, came up with this idea of um, uh, essentially a, a two battalion U.S. force. Um, one kind of uh, based in, in uh, Kabul, Air Mobile, with the assets to ensure that mobility. And the other battalion deployed in um, uh, uh, the key provincial centers, uh, Kandahar, Mazari Sharif, um, uh, Herat. Uh, at kind of the level of a, a company plus, uh, very able to hold their ground against uh, any likely force. And if there was a serious challenge, you had that air mobile battalion set to go in and really kick some posterior. So two battalions. We, we sent our messages to London and Washington, and like four hours later, I had my response which was, Crocker, go sit under a tree until this insanity passes from you. <laughs> There's no way we're going to send two battalions into Afghanistan. Uh, and I just think it was a very long time before we realized uh, uh, what we were up against. Oh, I believe that uh, uh, it has been... Uh, exaggerated that because of Iraq, Afghanistan suffered. Um, uh, uh, I believe uh, that because of Iraq, at least uh, during my uh, uh, period as ambassador, 
I was to a degree successful in increasing resources for Afghanistan saying uh, and that uh, um, uh, given what we're doing in Iraq which was huge that Afghanistan uh, uh, needed uh, uh, more attention, perhaps not as much as Iraq, given the, the, the challenge at that time in Afghanistan wasn't as great as the challenge in Iraq. The level of violence was not as high. There was concerns about resurgence. There was concern about misbehavior on the war part of what was called warlords uh, at that time, that we needed a greater level of effort. We, I got the uh, positive response more on the civilian side by increasing the reconstruction budget uh, by over a billion dollars uh, 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 but on the military front uh, uh, Ryan's uh, uh, analysis is quite right and and and, uh, uh, and there was not only an unwillingness to send more forces along the concept that Ryan talked about, but even to uh, uh, accelerate the creation of the Afghan National Army because they, uh, there was a push to get an agreement before doing anything on the final number, uh, which was the Afghans were pushing for 100,000 plus, uh, and the, uh, we were saying it should be 50 or lower. And I finally, I remember uh, in one meeting, I got a little disappointed and said we can't get to 100 before we get to 50 so why don't we get started uh, rather than hold it uh, the, the, the start of the project uh, to, to get the Afghans to agree that we, uh, to, to 50 because we're not going to get to 50 in three or four years so uh, we need to move uh, uh, earlier. Uh, I, I, I um, uh, do think that uh, Iraq may have had some impact and I'm not the right person to ask this whether some assets that are particularly relevant uh, to the conflict part were uh, uh, diverted there may be that on the economic on the, uh, on the reconstruction side Afghanistan uh, benefited uh, uh, because the numbers became so large that adding a billion to Afghanistan for the two conflict didn't see uh, although I see Ron's co complaint about his issue during his period Period. But at least in my uh, time, and we got uh, uh, we didn't suffer on the economic reconstruction front, but uh, there may have been some suffering that may have occurred uh, on, uh, on the military on the military side. But I don't know in detail what th that was. I think there was some, however. You know, th this is. I, I think we did hurt for the diversion. But I think when one tries to say exactly how much right. or how much better things could have been, yeah. that becomes very problematic and very hypothetical. On the military side, unquestionably, we hurt. We were we lost and could not get the uh, overhead observation that we needed. In fact, that was drained off. We were losing special forces. We were having great trouble getting the conventional force maintained, let alone expanded. Economics gets gets to be a very complicated question. Um, I salute the political and bureaucratic skill of my predecessor, who was able to get a very large increment. Um, I was then told, well, if you don't spend it all, you don't need any more. <laughs> doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean you don't, you know, yes, we know where we're going to spend it. We, this is a frequent U.S. government problem. If you have a lot of money, people say, you got money in the pipeline, you don't need any more, even if you know very much how you're going to spend it. <laughs> and if you spend it quickly, you say, look at the waste. You, you know, so you're, you're under pressure to spend and then criticized if you do so. It, it's a hard knot to get out of. The most complicated question, though, is one I absolutely cannot answer, and that is the degree of Afghan government response, Afghan political responsibility for the fact that by 2005 and six you had a situation ripe for increasing the insurgency as well because of a lot of ruinously bad governance. And so you had people who put down their weapons after 2001. Part of the Taliban's problem was a lot of people just went home. 
And uh, you know, a certain number of hardcore people in 2001 under the bombs looked around and sort of said, where are my buddies? Um, not uh, Many of those people were treated very badly. Now that's, you know, after years of civil war, that's to be expected in many respects. But the rapacious score settling of people who came to power with us drove many other people back into the insurgency and helped create the conditions for an insurgency. Whether we could have actually done very much about that, whether anybody could have done very much about that, you could have a very long discussion. But we should not, in kicking ourselves for taking our eyes off the ball, forget the Afghan share uh, in, in creating the, these conditions. Yeah. May I add one <laughs> yeah, footnote? Briefly, yes. but, uh, yeah. uh, I think Ron has uh, made a, uh, an excellent point uh, uh, that, in addition, uh, in a general uh, point that in Afghanistan we were involved in two things that maybe in Iraq too, uh, I don't know whether Ryan would agree with me, which is that we had a state and nation building almost, which is were terrible words uh, uh, to mention at that time, that in fact we had a, a situation which there was no state uh, in fact, and we were trying to help the Afghans set up a state. And a nation building to some extent to get an agreement, a compact among them as to what it means to be Afghan or what it means to be Iraqi, how they're going to organize that state uh, uh, and how they're going to participate in it. But at the same time, uh, increasingly we were doing counterinsurgency uh, operations as well. And sometimes the requirements of one uh, at, was intention with the requirements of the other. Uh, meaning, in order to do counterinsurgency, uh, uh, we could uh, cooperate with people that were not necessarily desirable. Uh, and sometimes people say, why are you working uh, with an uh, ex mini warlord or a big warlord or whatever names you give them? Because you needed to, to get things done in that area from a security and counterinsurgency uh, point of view. But your state and nation building uh, project would have required to, uh, and we had a visionary strategy for how to uh, decrease their capabilities and make them be political participants, uh, accept their new rules, uh, uh, and not to be a source of instability and problems uh, in, uh, for the local population that would then in, uh, help the insurgency in a sense because of their misbehavior in turn created that. So there was the Afghan responsibility, uh, Ron said quite correctly, their behavior, but there was also this conflicting requirements that uh, uh, demands on us as well and the way we responded to it. You, you know, there's there's another piece of yeah. that that I don't think my colleagues would disagree. Yeah. Ryan mentioned this light footprint, our unwillingness to engage. That meant that President Karzai had no ability to confront political troublemakers because we wouldn't help him do that. So political appointee, appointment became his only tool. It's not completely foreign to America, if you noticed some of our ambassadorial appointments. Uh, but <laughs> not, but not, no, no, it's not yours. Political appointee. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not. I'm not talking about who. I'm not talking about the fact of political appointees, but the question of the competence, uh, as you know. Um, but this was his only tool because he had no force and he had no money and we didn't want to provide force or money for political discipline. So there is a, there is a huge Afghan responsibility for the conditions that grew, but there is also a responsibility with us for not having helped provide any tools that might have given an alternative. Oh, in the very limited time that we have and the large number of uh, people who'd like to raise a question. I'm going to take three questions and hope that we can get through at least those. Uh, Steve Cohn? Uh, Stephen Cohn, Brookings, and former colleague of Marvin and also Zalmay. Uh, the one country you haven't mentioned here is Iran. 
which raises the question of uh, the security interest of the countries around Afghanistan. I think the proposition that uh, we have a vital interest in Afghanistan is debatable. That's probably not the place to debate it. But certainly the Iranians, the Pakistanis, the Chinese, the Indians, the Russians have a vital interest in Iran Afghanistan. Of course, the Afghans have an even more vital interest. Do you see us going back to Bonn for some kind of regional strategic architecture? Do you see us cooperating with Iran, perhaps, and even the Chinese in, in a, an arrangement where the major powers around Afghanistan can cooperate? Okay, let me have a question over here. Uh, let me take all the way in the, in the rear, a gentleman there. Uh, my name is Mike Gufford. I'm a U.S. Army service member, and I've served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. And my question is that given what our President Ghani's sincere efforts to reconcile with Pakistan, how sincere do you believe Pakistan is given the historical wariness of our long-term commitments to support Afghanistan and Pakistan for that matter? You want to hold that up? Uh, and, and our, and our short-term commitment of, of, our, of extending our relatively small number of forces to the end of 2016. Yeah. Lou, did you have a question? The Iran question got covered. Okay. Uh, let me take another question here. Uh, uh, right there. Yes, Rani. Yes. Annie Mullen. I'm a professor at the College of William and Mary. Um, it was stated by the panelists and Ambassador Newman in particular. Is your, that is your mic on? It is. Just louder. Okay, thank you. Um, that we don't have much of a negotiating position left to bring the Taliban to the table. But I would say that that the aid that we give to Pakistan is is a uh, a way of of uh, bringing them to the table. And and I would uh, like the to ask the panelists, what will it take for us to use our our, our, our support to Pakistan more strategically with regard to Afghanistan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take one more question and then we'll somehow divvy the, uh, the responses all the way back over there. That gentleman right there. Right. The, uh, Wait for the mic, please. With the uh, respect to the political cohesion of the unity government as an institution, do you see Abdullah Abdullah as having a certain breaking point in terms of his relationship? Relationship with Ashraf Ghani, and what would it be? Okay, there's there's a lot for you to chew on. Uh, why don't you choose which ones you would like to respond to? Uh, Sal, do you want? Thank you. Uh, well, on Pakistan, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it was a great source of frustration for me. Uh, 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 that we uh, couldn't make uh, uh, more progress with it uh, on dealing with the issue of the sanctuaries that were being developed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, um, at the present time, uh, I am uncertain myself as to uh, as Pakistan made a strategic decision uh, uh, by people that matter, uh, uh, that a reconciliation in Afghanistan is a, a, a critical or a vital interest of, of Pakistan. Uh, there is evidence that the internal situation has deteriorated, the security situation, that extremism and terrorism poses a huge problem for Pakistan. Uh, 165,000 troops now, or uh, Pakistani troops, are on the Duran line, near the Duran line fighting. And therefore, with a, a government in Afghanistan that is clearly anxious to improve relations with Pakistan, uh, I mentioned some of the steps. There is a r whole range of others that I did not mention on the economic front that the government, the current government, uh, President Ghani in particular, has thought about and is, uh, is open to and is actually advocates of increased economic cooperation with Pakistan. And the region, this whole idea of actualizing this idea idea that uh, existed almost from the day we went to Afghanistan, this land bridge idea that Afghanistan could be a transit point for uh, regional economic integration and development. Uh, 
and that whether given the change in Afghanistan with the new government uh, and the worsening security environment in Pakistan, that they would have made a qualitative uh, shift. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, there are indications uh, uh, that yes, uh, maybe, uh, but there are uh, also uh, uh, lingering, uh, perhaps, uh, evidence or concerns or, uh, or, or indications that uh, uh, um, maybe uh, the, the desire to be the preem to dominate Afghanistan through proxies uh, may be still there. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see. On the US leverage, uh, um, and I hope that it will be the former that they would have made a, 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 a decision. On the US assistance, uh, I think it is a key factor. Pakistan is in terrible economic shape uh, in terms of the, the insecurity has worsened the economic situation in terms of discouraging investments in Pakistan. And trade is, uh, has been, uh, is quite problematic. Uh, and uh, uh, um, and uh, there is more of a need for external support, of the, although the lowering of oil prices has been temporarily, at least for now, has been helpful. But uh, we have been reluctant to push uh, that uh, to, to the maximum extent possible. And, and, and because of the fears of the consequences of economic collapse, if, if uh, uh, I have been myself an advocate more of, of using uh, more of a leverage uh, because of, of the importance, especially when our people were getting killed, that our allies were getting killed by forces that it's at a sanctuary in Pakistan. Done. Uh, but, but I understood the complex calculation that f informs our relations with Pakistan, including the security of nuclear forces, that a collapse could create uh, unintended consequences that would make uh, make our job that much harder. So I, while I was sitting in Kabul, I was obviously my preeminent concern was uh, we need to stop uh, the sanctuary. But I understood why people in Washington had the, the broader calculations. And that, that, that they did. <laughs> at, at last, a difference in views. Uh, uh, while Zal was sitting in Kabul, I was sitting in Islamabad. Uh, um, and here again, history, I think, is very instructive. Uh, not just history objectively, if there is such a thing, but, but how history is perceived and influences decision makers of today. In, in Pakistan, the narrative of the U.S.-Pakistani relationship is, uh, and it's their narrative, not saying it is corresponds with reality, but it's their narrative, uh, is that we're not a reliable partner. Um, uh, and this goes way back, um, 1970. Uh, we, we did not stand with Pakistan in their eyes uh, in the, uh, uh, the struggle that led to the creation of Bangladesh and that uh, dismembered Pakistan uh, in, in, in their view. Uh, as we have said, uh, we, we pulled out, didn't have troops in, but we were very much engaged in the anti-Soviet Jihad and Pakistan was our partner in that. And then we pulled pitch and sanctioned them on the way out. Uh, what that means, in my assessment, uh, is that we've got to be darn careful uh, how we use assistance as a lever. Because we may think it's a lever. They would see anything moving in that direction. And this is, we've experienced this um, uh, with some initiatives in Congress as absolute proof positive. There go the Americans again. Um, um, uh, they're getting set to really stick it to us and that is an existential threat and we are going to hang on for life uh, to an asset like the Taliban, not necessarily because they like the Taliban, clearly it has bled over into their own security problems uh, but they could see far worse coming in Afghanistan if we pull pitch uh, in Pakistan and Afghanistan so you got to be very, very careful with that. Ron, I guess that means I have to respond to the other two questions yeah, that, yeah. You guys, that you guys walked around. Um, 
on, on Iran, first of all, I'm not sure that Iran, in fact, I tend to think that Iran does not see Afghanistan as anywhere near in the same category that it sees Iraq. Iraq has been, or the geographic space occupied by Mesopotamia, has been a threat to the Shia world since at least the Battle of Karbala. Uh, and the years I was in Iran, under the Shah, every year the four side was up in Tabriz in the west. Every year the Iranian army drilled its retreat from the Iraqi invasion and its regroupment and its pushing back of that invasion. So this, their view of Iraq as a strate potential strategic threat is very deeply ingrained. There is no similar view of Afghanistan, partly because Afghanistan hasn't really had that level of threat, maybe since it held off the last siege of Herat, um, and, and that was over 100 years ago. Uh, they are, the Iranians are neuralgic about what we may do in Iran, in Afghanistan. There is the potential of threat from us about which they're serious. So they, they do intervene. Uh, they court influence, but they have also been helpful in creating uh, better conditions in Afghanistan. They were helpful at Bonn. The dialogue which we had with them in Kabul uh, continued uh, until I got there, after I got there, but then I was ordered to stop it, which I thought was a mistake. Uh, so the short answer is I believe cooperation with Iran in an Afghan context is definitely possible. There's lots of ways you can mess it up from both sides. On the question of is there a point at which Dr. Abdullah will break um, or will find he has to break from the alliance? In theory, of course, there's such a point. A point at which he feels he's taking too much political embarrassment, that it destroys his career, that it destroys the potential of his alliance, uh, having a bid for power that simply embarrasses him. In, But these are all questions of degree. They're all dynamic questions. They're not it's sort of there's an absolute make or break issue that you can easily define. There are some issues that are particularly important to him, I believe. The issue of uh, a new election system is very important to him. Uh, the reformed election commission, I mean, these were issues that he used to sell his supporters on their requirement to take a secondary position in the government. So if he is too embarrassed in the outcome of those issues, that could be a problem. Uh, but he also has every reason to hype his presentation of those issues when talking to us because he wants us involved in getting them come out his way. So uh, analysis of this has to be very careful. The, the bottom line is, yes, there's a, there is such a point. No, we don't know where that point is. Yes, we need to be involved in order to try to avoid getting to that point. And no, we shouldn't be panicked at any particular moment to rush in in desperate fear. There is a point, and, and, but it's also a point that's important to the Ghani side of the government. It, the collapse of this government is going to be, I think, potentially fatal to both of them. And we need to keep reminding them of that and then hope to God they can sort things out between themselves most of the time. So it's there. We have to work on it. It's not automatic. <clears throat> I started this uh, afternoon's program by likening the three ambassadors to the three tenors. And whatever the differences may be, I'm sure you see the connection here in that we've had this afternoon three gentlemen with strong voices, clear voices, and most of the time in harmony. Yeah. Let's <laughs> join me now in thanking them.